of the emergency broadcast system. Tonight is March 8th, 2009. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Right now, it's Woe to Time, World of the Unexplained. This is Jay Scott. This is Trent Lackey. What? 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 Yeah, I'm what? Here. Yes. We, have a, we actually have a crew tonight. Chuck's yeah, in the I house. Know. D's in the house. I'm, I'm in the back. house. You're in the house. We're all in the house, people. I, I brought my gold microphone. <laughs> you know? I got some grills. I tell you, I tried to do this uh, almost by myself entirely last uh, week when it uh-huh. snowed and dropped so much snow out here, and it, it was awful. It was very pretty, though. I didn't realize how much I depended on you gentlemen to, uh, to make this... Reality, it just hurts me right here. A word so of acknowledgement, man. Yeah, it is. I give, give it up for the uh, yeah. O2 crew. Yeah. Yeehaw. So, anyway, uh, once again, we want to welcome our new listeners, um, KFNX in uh, News Talk in um, Phoenix, Arizona. You're listening to us tonight. And then our old listeners, we switched our times around a bit every Sunday night now from uh, 11, or excuse me, 10 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tonight we've got a great show for you. That's right. And that is uh, Mr. John Zaffis. He's uh, one of our old buddies from, uh, you may have seen him on, on, on The Haunting on TV. It's a series that they put together. Is that A&E? Yeah. A&E, yeah. okay. And actually the uh, Haunting in Connecticut movie. Yeah, um, and, you, and you might know him. He's not in it, but I mean, you know. Well, that's what we're going to talk about yeah, okay. a little tonight because it's based on a true story of a case that he actually investigated and uh, you can actually check out an interview we had with the woman that actually experienced these mm-hmm. things in our archives uh, later, uh, worldoftheunexplained.com. But John was actually there and witnessed some of these things, and I believe this is the case that led him almost to want to get out of the business. And we're going to talk to him about yeah, tonight. It was, it was such a, a really horrifying cool. encounter with this, with, with this demonic evil force. Uh, without further ado, Mr. John Zaffis. John, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, guys. How's everybody? Oh, we're oh, doing well, great. well. Hope you're doing well, John. Doing good, doing good. We, we need to, to go. We need to go investigate some stuff together again. It's been a long time. You got it. Let's go. <laughs> so what, what's it now? What is? Who's the guy that's supposed to be you in this film trailer? I see. Eliza Cateas is all I know is what his name is, and the understanding I got that um, you're watching him as he's intermingling, being the investigator and doing the different things there. That you can definitely tell that it's John Zaffis. <laughs> oh man, you didn't get to pick who was going to be you in the film, but uh, no, that's... unfortunately not. Well, now, now tell me what what happened with this because I heard when when we had interviewed, um, um, oh gosh, now our name's going to slip me, Carmen, Carmen Reed. Yeah, yep. yeah Carmen when we had interviewed Carmen um, a few weeks ago or a month or so ago, we spoke to her about this thing, and she was telling me that you just you went crazy. You left the house for a few days and just didn't know if you wanted to come back. It was such an event. We, it was uh, 21 years ago now, and um, one evening I was just sitting in the dining room documenting things. Everybody already had gone to bed, and uh, this very foul smell started coming through, and it got very cold in the house, and it was the month of August. And I got up from the table, and I was walking towards the uh, hallway and looked up the staircase, and there was something very transparent, murky-colored, and back then, the only thing I was able to describe it was like taking plastic bags and just crinkling them and crinkling them. Today, you know, I understand that to be the flutters of the wings. So basically, what I experienced, what transpired that night, that did. I was making a, a major choice that night. I got my keys, and the only thing I was interested in uh, was getting the hell out of that house. But the the whole thing was I didn't fear so much for myself because I chose to be there. I had it in my mind that if this creepy thing showed up to me, it was going to go to my house where my wife and three little kids were at the Mm -hmm. time. So I got home, everybody was sound asleep, everything was fine, but I made a decision that night. I didn't want nothing to do with the work anymore. I wanted nothing to do with it. It just, to me, really wasn't worth it, so I wouldn't talk to any of the family members, Carmen, other researchers, nobody. But... And, you know, at one point in time, uh, we were very good friends with a bishop within the family and everything. And 
you know, he had called, my wife came and got me, and he goes, John, we don't even know what happened. And I explained all the events to him and everything, and I had said to him, I said, the devil can have you all. I don't want nothing to do with it, and nothing to do with this stuff whatsoever ever again. And very quietly, he said, well, then it accomplished what it set out to do. And I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're claiming you're not going to be around to help people or investigate or anything, and that was its intent, and it sounds like it won. Well, that put a challenge to me. So three days later, I did end up going back into the home. I knew the uh, exorcism was set up. It was sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Church. It was performed, and it was very successful. And shortly right after that, the uh, family had moved out and was uh, basically trying to move on with their lives, and I stayed in the work and moved on with my career. Now, th- this this house that the family lived in, it used to be a, a funeral home or a funeral parlor of some type, didn't it? Right. It used to be a, a funeral parlor. Uh, years back, it sat, uh, I guess, vacant for several years. I don't remember exactly how many, and then somebody purchased it. They renovated it, and um, Carmen and uh, her family had moved in to the first floor, and they had the uh, rights to the basement, too. Now, when did you first get involved with this? And for people that don't know who you are, and I I don't know where they've been if they don't, but, uh, (laughs) you know, John does does the the kind of work we're talking about is is, uh, he helps people that have uh, problems with demonic uh, attacks, hauntings, that kind of thing, johnzaffis.com. Z a f f i s, um, you know, he's also uh, related to the Amityville horror uh, incident because his aunt and uncle, his uh, uncle, I believe Ed was was the one that got you in the business. God rest his soul. Yeah, uh, 30, uh, 36 years I've been involved with doing the work, but did I always believe in it? No. When I was uh, sixteen years old, had a sighting of a ghost or an apparition, and at that point in time, that's when made me start thinking about it and started researching and reading everything I could get my hands on and took it a step farther and wanted to start doing investigations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then took it a step farther, and I wanted to know, do people get possessed? Do their heads spin around? Do they spit up green pea soup? I wanted to know all this. And it took uh, an awful lot of convincing for me to convince my uncle to finally let me get involved with it. And, you know, 21 years later, I reflect upon that because he sat me down and he just talked to me and was explaining everything to me. He goes, you know, doesn't have hooves, doesn't have tail or horns, John. That's not the way it works. It works behind the scenes. It'll affect your family, your friendships. He says it'll affect all different areas of your life that, you know, you've never been exposed to. And he went into a a lot more conversation and everything. And I I can remember as clear as day, he leaned across his desk, he looked at me, and he says, you sure you want to get involved with this kid? And I looked at him and laughed, and I said, "Eh, I'm not worried about it. And he had such a serious look on his face, he goes, I am. He goes, you're my blood, you're my nephew, and I don't want to have to deal with my sister if something happens to you. (laughs) So at that point, that's when I started getting involved with uh, meeting a lot of different clergy people they worked with from all different religions and getting involved with uh, witnessing the exorcisms and setting up the cases. And the more involved I got, the more different people I intermingled with and the, the, the different clergy and things like that. It was astounding to me that we had this whole world that was so secretive. Well, let me, and let me, let me. no one talks. I mean, they talk more today about it than they ever did before, but... It, back then, it was just so secretive, and you didn't dare mention that, quote-unquote, you were a demonologist or you got involved with uh, exorcisms or anything, because then you were considered to, you know, basically be a devil worshiper. Now, let me, let me but, give a uh, number. Today, it's looked at and viewed a lot differently over the past couple of years than it was in the past. Now, let, me, let me give a number real quick, John. Um, 877-722-7382 is toll-free here in the United States and Canada. You can call it. That's 1-877-722-7382. That's 877-SCARE, the letter U, the number 2, if you can remember it easier that way. Um, and you can call in, and John will talk to you tonight about his experience there. And if maybe you're going through your own kind of uh, paranormal uh, encounter that, that you need some kind of... Uh, uh, some kind of explanation yeah, for true. it. Maybe John can help. How many exorcisms have you been involved with, John? Tons. I, uh, uh, so many different uh, avenues is what I try to explain to people today. You know, uh, being involved directly, probably a good hundred. 
but I intermingle with a lot of different clergy and, and paranormal investigators, and there, there's just an unlimited number of different cases, especially over the past several years, that I get involved with that either the property is going to need a clearing or the person's going to need a deliverance or an exorcism. And a few years back, I just gave up count. I don't even keep track anymore. Hmm. Uh, walk us through, um, you, you just mentioned a, a property being cleared versus an exorcism. Now, we most people who know about this stuff, uh, you, you know, they kind of have a general idea as how exorcism works. Um, walk us through a general property clearing. If you, you know, if you have some trouble, what, what, would, what would be the steps that would take place? Uh, usually going in evaluating to see if you got the negativity there, the negative energy. And then basically it's uh, set up where I have set prayers that I use, and we burn high church incense. We sprinkle a lot of holy water around, holy salt. We start on the lower level, and we work all the way up to the top. And then we bury, bury metals around the house on the outside and also definitely go around with the holy water around the exterior of the perimeter of the home. Okay. Um and we definitely recommend to people once this has been done and everything to try and leave the house vacant for 24 to 48 hours so that way any remaining energy will dissipate and actually be broken after we do that i was saying what you bury outside the houses uh when you said metals you're, you're talking about catholic medallions uh saint medallions or, or are we talking about something else that you bury uh, yeah, outside? it depends on what you're dealing with what the people's faith is and you know, there's different methods and different ways that I use different things, could use metals, and there's, you know, other things that are also used to help to seal a property, too, because like I said, not everybody's Christian or Roman Catholic or anything, so you got to keep a wide variety of different methods that you use to try and bind or clear a piece of property. Now, now John, um, you've got a book out. And I want to I want to definitely promote that. What's the site for that? Is that shadowsofthedark.com? Yes, it is. Okay, yep. you need to check that out, folks. Uh, really good read. I've got a signed copy, uh, anyway, but uh, really good read and uh, very interesting. If you want to know about the work and about how John got started with it, but I want to hear more about since this movie's coming out, it's going to be a blockbuster phenomenon, I believe. And uh, I want to know about what what happened. What what do you know about the film as far as what they've embellished uh, or creatively licensed, as Hollywood likes to call it, versus I what really, really happened? I really don't know because I haven't seen it. Okay. So I really don't know what actually is in there, what isn't in there, or what has gotten changed. At this point in time, you know, I've tried to find out. Believe me, I have. But <laughs> unfortunately, I have not. Okay. Well, uh, Carmen had actually seen the premiere, or a private screening, and when she was up here in New York City, unfortunately, I wasn't in Connecticut. I was down in Texas, so I missed out on it. Well, they they, <laughs> they, they said something about a séance in the uh, in the the trailer I saw for the film. Did, was there ever a séance performed in the house before you got involved or after? Um, there was a séance. I know one evening that transpired in the home. And um, I was not there that evening when it transpired. Okay. Well, what, what, what got her to call you? How did you get in touch with this lady to help her? Uh, basically, I was a researcher for uh, Ed Warren and uh, working for him and got called in from there and ended up spending nine and a half weeks in that house. Wow. Now, what, what finally happened at the end of the nine and a half weeks? Were the exorcism successful or was it? It, it was a completely successful exorcism on the first attempt everything got broken uh there were, with the activity that that transpired with the exorcism there was a you know a few rumbles we got the uh, really weird odors as you know it was transpiring and everything because a lot of times with uh, property clearings it's not as you know it, it's totally different from dealing with an individual i mean you could have you know a person thrashing around and carrying on the voices in the whole nine yards where on a property you're not going to get that but what you look for is to see if there's a lighter type of a feeling and to see if things actually had broke and that transpired and that was the first time in nine and a half weeks i ever felt very light and felt comfortable in that house you didn't have that heavy negative feeling you weren't continuously on guard after the exorcism was performed now, you, you've spoken with Carmen since she's seen the film. What did she think of it? 
I'm sorry? I said you've spoken with Carmen since since she's seen the uh, premiere of the film. What did she think about it? I don't know. She wouldn't tell me. She I told me I had to wait to go see it. Oh, God. Come on. <laughs> come on. I'm serious. Oh. I'm serious. Oh, man. So what's what's besides this film, what, what are you doing now? If, if you can talk about some of this stuff, what are you uh, what are you investigating right now? Where have you where have you been using your time? Well, uh, basically still lecturing. Uh, i got uh, three or four campuses I'll be doing in uh, March here in Pennsylvania and um, doing a big uh, conference down there at Gettysburg at the end of the month. Uh, doing my investigations, definitely keeping busy. Uh, we did wrap up my second book, Possess Possessions. It's completed. It's done. We're just waiting and to uh, finally get it to hit the presses and finally get out there. Um, Investigation-wise, uh, things have seemed to have, as far as I'm concerned, they really seem to have gotten intense. And I don't know if it's due to, you know, all the recognition that's given today or what it is, but, you know, I'm finding more where we have that heavy subdued within the houses. People are getting scratched. People are getting bit. You know, it, it just seems that things have gotten so much more intense over the past couple of years than I've seen in the past. Do you think this is culminating to, to, to something big? I definitely do. I mean, I was never a very firm, big believer in, you know, things lining up, but it's awful coincidental how things have intensified on the spiritual level and all these different things. And when you see them all line up, it, you know, it kind of makes you take a step back and look at things. I mean, you know, just like with the Dead Sea Scrolls or some of the different things from, you know, thousands of years ago, several different uh, cultures uh, believed and predicted different things uh, leading up to 2012. I don't think it's the end of the world, no, but, <laughs> I mean, it's just awfully bizarre how so many of these things they predicted and how they were all coming to pass and pulling together. It gets uh, pretty creepy and pretty scary when you see the big picture. Well, we've got uh, Ron from Raleigh on, on the line here. Uh, Ron, how you doing tonight? I'm doing just fine. How how do you guys hear me? Oh, good. Sound great. Okay. Um, here's my question for Mr. Zaffis. Um, uh, what percentage are Christians seeking Christ through exorcism versus the number of people who get presented to you uh, by third parties, like, say, by the church or by um, family members, let's say? I'm sorry. I, I could barely hear you. What was the question, sir? I was going to say, what percentage of the people who come to the exorcism process are Christians that are seeking Christ again through the process of exorcism versus the number of people who are presented by, say, their families or um, another third party? Yeah, really? That, that's a tough call because uh, here again, I intermingle directly, you know, just through my organization with uh, cases that come through to me, not necessarily all just Christian. But I deal with a lot of different clergy, you know, Roman Catholic, Buddhist, you name it. And with family members, that's you. I, I would say that is probably about the least. So, right. you know, them seeking out the help. Because today, we're very fortunate. People look at things from the big picture. And they try to figure out what the heck is going on and what is happening. And is this something happening on a paranormal level? So usually, you know, with the, with the family directly, seeking out the help is the least. The next would be where I get things that uh, come in, you know, through the website and referrals. And then um, the majority, as far as from a Christian perspective, I would say would come from clergy. Would come from clergy. So, so people don't usually just approach you and say, I believe I've got um, uh, in my spiritual communion with Jesus that there's a demon plaguing me or possessing me or something, and they ask for you to restore their communion with Christ to the exorcism. That's very infrequent. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I see. Um, well, in the process of the exorcism itself, how do you emphasize um, reuniting with Christ? Like, do you emphasize the process of communion or rejoining the Christian community is the is, have you seen in your experience that exorcism is something that is is like defined by your removal from the Christian community in other words if you feel that you have a spiritual influence that's taking you away from Christ obviously that's going to keep you from having communion spiritually but does it something that physically separates people from the church well it can be you know you you have to keep a, a, a an open mind when you're dealing with a lot of these things you have a lot of conflict today 
um, across the board with all religions. And, you know, a key factor to me is, uh, you know, because I'm not a Bible thumper. That, that's we, we, we've established about. that, John. Uh-huh. <laughs> we've established that, John. <laughs> Listen here, you heretic. Anyway, <laughs> you know, when, when dealing with this, sure, absolutely. I mean, I do, you know, have uh, my belief systems. I am Roman Catholic. I am practicing. But if you're bringing a person forth and you're trying to get them spiritually resolved, and it's from a, a Christian perspective, absolutely. We sit down, we talk, we have to go through all these different things. And once a person is exercised, they need to fill that void back in with a positive. So if that means, you know, uh, explaining to an individual and trying to help them to get themselves back into a mainstream of a belief system or a structured type of environment, that's very critical and it's very important. Because if they leave themselves wide open and vulnerable, then, you know, these people are going to have problems again, and it'll come back tenfold. In the Roman Catholic model, that would be through daily prayer, through devotions to saints, through things of that nature is what you would fill your day with to keep you from being in the vulnerable position where you felt you'd been or had some spiritual interference to start with, right? Absolutely. Ron, we're going to have to let you go. We're coming up on a hard break, okay, buddy? Thank you for calling. Thanks, Ron. Hey, same here, guys. I'm listening, and uh, I always am going to tune in. You bring so much interesting stuff uh, to my table. So, uh, Awesome. Well, thank we you. We appreciate it. All right. Thank Good you. Night. All right. And uh, it was Ron Hunter from um, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, John, we're, gonna, we're, we're coming up on a hard break here in a little bit. But, you know, how many people that you – just a quick question, if you can keep your answer under two minutes. How many people come to you that were – christian at one time or or not even christian or buddhist or anything that after an exorcism is performed say you know what i want to be a roman catholic um i i would say probably you could find if you on a scale from one to ten probably a six or a seven that's a pretty high number yeah that is yeah you know because here again um, w- with this, because today, you know, people question everything. They question every religion there is. Sure. And when you're dealing with an individual that doesn't believe in anything, but yet you offer, you know, to be able to get this person help from a, a, a perspective of Christianity or something, um, 99% of them all say the same thing to me. Now i got to change the way I view things and look at things. If this happened to me and I went through this on a negative level, there has to be a positive. Sure. So here yeah. again, too, you know, uh, when a person recognizes that and they realize that, you, you'll find that a person will follow a path of something they're comfortable with, with uh, Christianity or a religion that's on a positive note. All right. That's well, thanks, uh, thanks yep. John. Uh, the number here, toll-free, one eight seven 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 two two seven three eight two. That's 877-SCARE-U-2. 877-SCARE, the letter U, the number 2. You're listening to World of the Unexplained. We've got John Zaffis tonight. We're talking about a haunting in Connecticut. Uh, We'll be right back in just a few moments after this. And we're back. We are. Worldoftheunexplained.com for all your paranormal needs. (laughs) That's right. If you you like... like, Go ahead. No, I was just going to... No, go ahead. If you want to give us a call, we got uh, Jay-Z. Jay-Z. No, I'm just kidding. John Zaffis. That's Jay Z. Yeah, it's Jay Z. Yeah, okay. It's his new rap. Yeah, term his uh, his rapping na- it's his rapping name. Uh, John Zaffis, um, uh, paranormal, paranormal investigator extraordinaire. Give us a call. Eight seven 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 two two seven three eight two. That's eight seven one eight seven seven. Scare you two. <laughs> scare the letter you the number two, and scare you'll be the band. You'll, you'll it'll it'll jump you right in here, and you can talk live with us and with John That's right. about anything paranormal going on in your life. Uh, famous paranormal researcher. That's true. John, how, how are you again? John? Hello? Okay, yes, can, hey. you hear, can you hear us, John? Okay, now, there you go. I got you now. Okay. okay. Um, you know, you know what, what really upsets me a little bit? You've been doing this for a long, long time with you know the taps guys and everybody else in this community because it really is a small community if you go back to the guys that have been doing it a long time and you don't have your own tv show i mean what what gives here somebody needs to pick this thing up and roll with it yeah because i'm a pain in the ass and you know that (laughs) fair enough impossible Uh, to work with we all know impossible you know so you know so far you know 
watching it and you know and I go back you got to remember many many years ago and everybody used to rip my aunt and uncle up the Warrens all the time yeah so you know, seeing a lot of the different things and being involved with them I mean any of these TV shows that are out there I mean there isn't any of these guys I don't know on a personal level and everything like that it, it's a hard commitment these guys work 12 14 hours a day sometimes they're not home for weeks at a time when, when you get involved with a, a, a production of a weekly t TV show, it really can pull a lot from you and from things you're involved with. I mean, you know, never know. Someday, yeah, I might. But right at this moment, guest appearing on a lot of the different shows that are out there, I've been pretty comfortable with that so far. No, ours is one of the best. and uh, <laughs> Yes, of course. That's why we get all the good guests, you mm -hmm. see. Uh, yes. But, uh, you know, we've been doing it a while, too. But, uh, you know, it's just uh, whatever happened with Lou Gentilly, I haven't heard anything out of him in a long time. And, and uh, I haven't either. I had lost touch with him a few years back, unfortunately. Um, I had heard that he relocated from a mutual friend. And, um, unfortunately, I think he just totally pulled out of the paranormal, uh, per se, because he just got fed up with everything. Huh. Hmm. That's, 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 a, that's too bad. That's loss. what I actually think. <laughs> terrible loss. I like Lou. He was a good guy. Yeah. But um, well, anyway, well, t tell us. You know, you, you've 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 went to, you went into this house. You saw all these things. You know, go down and transpire. Um, I guess whoever's living in the house now is not having any trouble since the exorcism. Okay, can't hear you guys. Sorry. I guess whoever's living in the house now, they don't have any problems with anything because of the success of the exorcism. What What was the question? No one, Sorry, you cut out. I couldn't hear you. No problem. I said the people living in the house now, do they have any problems with anything? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And, you know, the, the Amityville Horror, now, how, what was your involvement in, in that? Well, I wasn't uh, really directly involved with it or anything. I was only 16 years old when um, the Warrens actually investigated that. But I did have an opportunity to lecture with uh, George uh, a couple of different times. And, you know, sitting down talking to him with the downtime and everything like that and listening to a lot of the different events and some of the things that occurred in there, you know, because I hear this all the time, do I think it was legit, do I think it was haunted? I know something transpired. Something happened in there on a paranormal level. Um, as far as the books and the movies and everything, you know, here again, you got a lot of hype just like with anything else out there when it gets Hollywoodized, as I call it. <laughs> and, but... Bottom line, I do definitely feel that there was some type of paranormal activity that did transpire in there. Sure. I don't think the walls oozed or the toilets blew up or doors <laughs> got ripped off. I mean, there, w there was a red little room. Yeah. That, that was there, there was a truth to that that was right, right underneath the staircase. Now, what, now you know, uh, we've, we've done one, uh, one little investigation with you with a few years ago in Twin Lakes at the lodge there. That was uh, an interesting, uh, interesting bit of... Uh, of scariness. Okay, I lost you. Oh. <laughs> what is going on? Is this is this a hybrid here, guys? What's going on here? It's, it's the phone. All right. Um, <laughs> Your phone's being possessed, John. <laughs> that, that's what's going on here. Uh, what was this? What is the scariest exorcism you've ever been involved in? I think that was a couple of years back, and um, you know, you always think you've been around everything and you've experienced anything, everything that could possibly occur. But I always used to read about when a person's eyes turn milky white, that you're dealing with something on a hierarchy. Well, mm -hmm. about a year, two years, two years ago, I was involved with an exorcism, you know, got called in to assist. And um, as they were going through the first round of the exorcism prayers, the guy opened his eyes and they were milky white. And I'm like, what is this? Closed them. They went to the second round of the prayers and everything, and he kept them open a little bit longer. I was quite astounded at what I saw. But then when they went through the third round, he kept them open. And looking, you know, at them, they were the milky white. You could see the pupils. You could see everything to it. And he wasn't blinking. He wasn't doing anything. There was no thrashing, no carrying on or anything like that. And it just took me back because it was the first time I've ever witnessed it. I read about it over the course of years, heard people talk about it. But... Here again, once you witness something like that, it totally changes your mind. Now, normally when I'm involved with any of these uh, types of situations, I usually stand near the client, 
hold them down so they don't go to attack the clergy or anything. This day, I chose not to. I don't know why, but I, I didn't go near the person whatsoever. So anyways, after experiencing that and everything, I was all wound up and everything. I'm calling doctors. I'm calling psychologists. I'm calling my old paranormal buddies. I'm calling everybody and telling them of the event and what I had witnessed. And each and, each and every person that I had talked to that's familiar with exorcism said, did you touch that person? And I went, no. I said, that's a bizarre thing. I had no interest in even going near them. And they had informed me that that was such a hierarchy, like a seven or an eight on a scale of 10, that by touching that person, you're granting permission for that uh, negative or the demonic to gravitate right towards you. Ooh, wow. So, you know, here again, sometimes our common sense or, you know, whatever you want to call it, logic uh, kicks in and, and just basically tells you, you know, and you follow that. I always tell people within our field and our work, always follow your gut instincts because 99% of the time you, that's going to be right on the money. Now, a, a lot, the, you have a lot of new people wanting to get involved with the paranormal investigation. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, things do you, would you like to relate to those people as far as any kind of advice? Lost your buddy. Oh. What kind of advice would you have for anyone entering the paranormal field? The key thing is study as much as you possibly can. Try to learn. Try to hook up with people that have been in the field for a while. And try to, you know, gain the knowledge through the other individuals because that, that's very key in our field. You know, there's so much that occurs, so much that happens. It's important to be able to understand that. Unfortunately, today we... You know, I call it an epidemic, and it's a thing where people are just throwing up, you know, pages and opening up being a paranormal group and getting involved with some serious issues and cases, and they're very unprepared to get involved with it. And I hear the same thing time and time again. You know, we just didn't think this existed. We didn't think people got attacked like this and everything, and now the, you know, the researchers are having problems, the family's having problems, and it makes it very difficult. So I always tell people, if you, if you can, take, take that time, take that opportunity to learn and study it just like you would any other field before diving into a lot of it. That's a good point. Now, another thing that, that our listeners may not be aware of, can you hear me okay, John? Yeah, I can hear you uh, now. Okay. Um, is that under, <laughs> this is just. Oh, you, I just lost you again. <laughs> okay. Under your house, you ha you have a pretty substantial collection of interesting um artifacts shall we say from your various investigations um have you uh, have you added to that collection here in the last couple of years and what what's what's new down there oh a couple of um, new military jackets some dolls probably a past couple of years oh gosh they, you name it i think the most current item um that came in was this collector's doll from a series that a woman had picked up and um, she liked it and she was trying to add it to her collection and she was getting violently ill touching the doll. She was getting headaches. There was all kinds of weird feelings within the room. And um, that came in, I think, about a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. But the, the real interesting one that I got this past October was a Merlin. And it's about a foot and a half tall. It's like one of those designer type things. But um, this one young uh, gentleman on campus got himself involved with practicing a lot of different things and learning what Merlin had done and everything and actually started summonsing and opening up the doors to different things. And oh my they started having major problems with this particular Merlin doll, best way I can describe it. But um, he got so big and so heavy into it that he set up an altar and had it up there and was putting all these different types of amulets and stones and everything in pouches and tying it to the doll. Wow, So the activity got so bad within the room, they uh, basically took it out, put it in another room, same type of occurrences. Then it just reached a point where it ended up in a uh, faculty member's uh, closet in the office, <laughs> and they were petrified to even go near it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So after I got done lecturing and everything, uh, I had this whole crew following me over as um 
removing this Merlin from the closet <laughs> and taking it and putting it out in the car. Oh my gosh, that's that's just crazy. Um, you're a brave man, John, to even have that stuff under your house. What do, what do you do to prepare when you have to? Uh, I don't know if this kind of ties into your new book or not, but and if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine. But what do you uh, what do you do to prepare to um, get that stuff to keep it from affecting you and your family? Yeah, uh, normally none of those things come into the museum. They usually go out in the building out and back, and there's different prayers I do over them. I use uh, blessed salt or water. There's uh, several different methods, and a lot of times I'll repeat that several different times over the items, hoping to either have it cleared or to actually bind it to the item. Now, I'll, here again, a lot of the binding different type things uh, with the items, those are all in cases and things that I just don't want people to touch because people love to tempt fate when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. So, there, like I said, there, there's many items down in the uh, museum today that are inside of cases just so people won't touch them or trigger anything that could be with those items. Mm. That's fair. <clears throat> now, now, doesn't your, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't your aunt, uh, Lorraine Warren, doesn't she still have a, some kind of haunted Raggedy Ann and, and, and Annie doll? Well, she's, uh, she definitely still has her museum up and going. She's still lecturing. She's doing very well. And Annabelle is still up there in the museum with them. That that's just creepy. Yeah. That 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 thing has creeped me out ever since I was a little kid. Are you kidding? <laughs> uh, it reminds me of Chucky. You know the whole. Well, uh, I, I I don't know. I, yeah, dolls are just kind of. I don't know what to say about them. <laughs> They're like clowns. They're just scary. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Call us here toll free one eight seven 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 two two seven three eight two one eight seven 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 two two seven three eight two. Uh, 1877 scare you to um, talk with John Zappas tonight a haunting in Connecticut now didn't they do a didn't they do a little special on this on the on the haunting show yes they did a a haunting in Connecticut on the Discovery Channel in 2004 okay and so this movie is based on um, your experience there like the show was but obviously a, a more dramatic and a much more expensive venture this time around to my knowledge Okay. To my knowledge, what? Uh, the Discovery Channel one, they they pretty much got that uh, with a lot of the facts and the different things that had occurred in there. They'll probably offer that on the DVD. I'm sure they're they're working something out with that. Mm. Uh, that's our, it's already done. It would this past September, they had made the DVD up of that one, and that is available online. Okay, cool. That's cool. Yeah, I've I, I've actually heard that you can watch it on online in segments or something. I, I haven't looked for it, but. Um, no, no. DVD is better. John, give us give us all your websites real quick. I know you got a ton. Okay, of uh, the best way to get a hold of me to find anything out is johnzaffis. dot com, and that takes you into all the other websites, MySpace, Facebook, all these different things, and <laughs> <laughs> you know my email address and everything on everything, and uh, my telephone number. If I'm home in in Connecticut. Uh, gladly talk to you or get back to you as soon as I can. How many people a week do you uh, do you hear do you uh, help these days? Well, the, here again, that, that depends between organizations, emails, telephone calls, and different clergy. I could deal anywhere from ten people to you know thirty different situations that I could be involved with in one week's time. Wow! My gosh, that's. Amazing. I mean, it, it's a, it really is, and. You know, anybody, if you ever ask anybody that's uh, hung up here for a week, hang out up here for a weekend or any amount of time, they all do the same thing. They'll go, John, how do you do that? How do you get through that? And your phone starts in the morning, it doesn't stop, and, you know, you continuously just keep going and going and going. And But that's okay, as long as you're being able to share some of the information or knowledge, you know, with other paranormal investigators or clergy or somebody to be able to help them out with something. To me, that's the bottom line. Yeah, that's tr now, very true. Are you are you still working with uh, Father Larry? Absolutely, we still work together. Um, we've been friends for many many years. Actually, he'll be here tomorrow for dinner. Okay, <laughs> cool. And um, <clears throat> uh, from one at one point in time, did you were you and him? I, I believe pu putting together some kind of pilot show. Uh, it's called Haunted Destinations, okay. and um, the, several of us have gotten together and. Had uh, shot a pilot on that, and uh, hopefully one of these days, maybe it'll get picked up. Cool, very cool. Maybe so. 
Oh, I don't, I don't have anything to say okay. except maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> Sh- Shadowsofthedark.com is the latest book. Um, www.johnzaffis.com is the website. And uh, you also have uh, your investigation uh, tools for your organization. That's also, is that a different site, John? Yes, that's uh, prsne.com. PRSNE.com. If you want to speak with John Zappas, you've got a little bit of time remaining, 877-722-7382. That's toll-free in the U.S. and Canada, 1-877-722-7382. We could uh, uh, maybe talk about your new book if you want to, um, your Possessed Possessions. Is that the name of it? Yes, it's. Um, uh, we named it Possessed Possessions, and there's like uh, 35 items in there. Now, I had broken it down deliberately because I wanted to do a, a collection of five volumes with all the different things and the different cases and everything. So trying to keep it as light and airy as I possibly can, and um, I'm looking very forward to that one finally coming out. And when will that be uh, coming out? Uh, every time I say a date, I jinx it, and it ends up getting delayed. <laughs> okay, well... <laughs> But um, I'm hoping by the spring we'll have it out. Okay, that'd be cool. We'll a lot, have, lot of. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, I want to. I want to check it out, read it. Yeah, so. a lot, lot of good pictures and stuff. Uh, what we have done was we created uh, a coffee table version, as they call it. Oh, cool. One side is uh, the page is the complete picture of the item, and on the opposite side will be the uh, story on what transpired, what happened, and how I ended up with the item. <laughs> God, that's just weird. I know. That is just weird, man. You keep this in your house. But, you know, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Safest no, place dude, to keep nothing's it. Nothing's in the house anymore. I built a barn last year. Oh, all of it's outside now. Oh, yeah, okay. Everything, including me, is outside. <laughs> including you. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. Well, goodness. better better in the barn than in the house. Yeah, that's my wife's theory too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say. Has, um, your, has your family ever had any trouble with any of the stuff down there when it was in the house? No, no one would ever go down there. Well, no, no wonder. <laughs> yeah, no one ever, uh, never ventured down there or anything like that. I mean, if they wanted me or something, they'd stand at the, the threshold screaming for me till I came out. So. <laughs> but you know, today, you know, well, what's funny about the whole thing too is once the all the items in my office and everything was moved out of there, I actually had Larry come over and do a complete blessing and everything on the uh, lower level of the house just to make sure. Okay. Huh. So now it's just a regular old basement now, I take it. Yeah. Like regular things. <laughs> That's good. No, no, no demonically haunted uh, <laughs> basement anymore. <laughs> no, uh, not at all. Uh, excellent. Um, and, uh, and, and you're still working with Father Larry. That's good to hear. Um, I think we've got a caller. Do we? Yeah, he's, he's raising his hand at me and gesturing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. We've got a caller. It is Ron again from Raleigh, North Carolina. Go ahead, Ron. Hey, so I've got sort of another follow-up question, um, and this goes back to the Merlin doll and um, and things like that that people use when they want to try to um, pursue something other than Christianity. If um, if possession occurs from a personal quest for power, can you explain how power in Christianity works? Like how it's different? I get. I guess what I'm saying is. In Christianity, you leave the power with Jesus at all times, and then you know you use the the power of communion and the things, and and let the power stay with God. How is it different for people that are that are think they are possessed? Well, the the only difference is you're going into a negative level. The power goes within the demonic, and the power you know they control that situation. So what you always have to remember, you have the the power of the positive and you have the power of the negative it's just you know th- it, that's just the bottom line with it and that's how it actually works well, because I anything on a works. negative level too you you have to remember it's intent it's intent is to gain power and it's uh, intent is to gain total control of that individual to manipulate them to be able to do things that it wants achieved Right, which is destroying Christianity, basically, whether in the individual or through their actions to a greater community. Is that what you found to be your experience? It, it, its uh, objective is to destroy anything, not just Christianity. Just, all right, so it's very self-destructive. So people are in life, a lot of power is very much a part of life. How do people, when they're looking for personal power in their life, 
what are some things that you can put um, on the table now to say, you know, if you're going down a pathway to power and you start to interact with things, how can people realize that, that they've made that mistake? Even though, you know, obviously there's very subtle things that, that can go wrong in someone's life. Like, you know, you said there seems to be an aura around conflicting with evil that can follow you home even. How, um, how can an individual who thinks they're, they're straying into this area, this dangerous area, start use to com- Use common sense. Right. Have you I mean, you know, here, here again, too, if you're going down a path and you're starting to open up the doors, getting involved with paranormal things or getting involved with different types of uh, cult activity or anything, then you better prepare yourself that you're going to have something happen with you, especially on a negative level. I mean, you know, the, the bottom line, you know, that's up to an individual. We all have free will, and if they choose to get involved with those things, they're leaving themselves wide open for any type of paranormal activity on a negative level to actually transpire. Oh, cool. Ron, yeah. we, we got to go. We're at the end of the show here. Thanks so much for calling again. Okay, guys. Thank thanks. you. John, thanks for being on. Well, thanks for having me on, buddy. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Definitely. Absolutely, Long yeah. time no hear from. I know. We need, to, we need to talk more. I know. I know. Every time we try to pull together, something always comes up. <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get it together some You got it. Days. Take care, John. Okay. Take Thank care, you. guys. Bye-bye. 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 And that was John Zaffis, uh, paranormal investigator. Extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. He didn't get to use that <laughs> word. But now I did. Well, yeah. And heck, heck of a nice guy, you know? Really nice guy. Um, to, to take that much time to go out there and, and, and help people with whatever it is they need um, to do. Helping, helping people with, with their paranormal problems. That's true. Cleaning the paranormal house. That's true. Bringing in the light. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Taking it uh, out and chopping it up. That's right. I don't know what that means. Anyway, <laughs> we're uh, next week. I, I don't know. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name off, offhand. I think it's Peter or something or other. And I, I just don't have the sheet in front of me. But we're going to be talking That's about. Prepared. We're Yeah, of course. We're going to be talking about the occult theme uh. in the Nazi regime and how Hitler tried to tap into the occult to uh, move his transition of power we forward. I, oh, we haven't done that in a long time. I, it's going to be. It's going to be pretty awesome. Heck yeah! So, so uh, uh, listen in, guys. Yeah, check that out. Um, and. You know, go to our website, worldoftheunexplained.com, and, uh, you know, check that out, too. We've got some old podcasts up you can listen to, download all kinds of craziness. Um, this is Jay Scott, your only JD DJ um, on this show. <laughs> okay. This is Trent Lackey here. We're coming to you from Kernersville, North Carolina, a small town where we talk about big things. Chuck, take us out. We